So thank you for so much for, for giving the opportunity to, to come here and, and, and talk about uh, the financial crisis, the way out and the way, the way, the way forward. It's really, really a pleasure for me to come to, to, come to Dublin and, 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 uh, and, and, and tell you a few things about how, how, I, can, how, how I look at what, is, what, what has been going on and what ought to be going, ought to be going on in the, in the future. Uh, I can talk about these various aspects of this for hours, so this is really just scratching on the scratching on the scratching scratching on the on, 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 on the on, on the surface and it's always then when you do that sort of hard to fully 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 figure out where to where, where to start and, and where to where, where to end. And this is more actually in the form of a conversation uh, about what is what, what is going on than a kind of a a very, very sort of formal lecture lecture or or speech, but let's get uh, let's get going on the on the on the current uh, financial crisis. Now let's see how if I can get this thing to work. Oh, that's that's how you do it. Uh, well, there are many many different views on the on, of course on the current financial crisis and where it came from and, and what is different this one this time compared to other 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 ones that we have that 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 we have had and and what has been. What has been been going going on? I think that the bottom line is kind of what what you always find exposed when there is a financial crisis: too much leverage in one way or the other, and that wasn't always fully understood when when this was sort of built up over a number of years. Everybody was happy, and and most people felt that maybe if it's not sustainable, I'll get out before all the other ones get out. And, and uh, we know from a huge number of countries uh, that it doesn't work that way because when, when, when you can't increase the size of the door when everybody got, tries to get out the door, it gets sort of kind of crowded and then you end up with all sorts of problems uh, with, with, with that. This time uh, we, ha we have had a, a mismatch between the financial activities and the regulatory and supervisory framework. This is very, very gen expressed in very general, general terms, but a few... Uh, a few things that are actually different this time compared to other, 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 in, in other past episodes. Looking back over history, mostly financial crises have been sort of national in some sense, or maybe a few countries, but not transnational in the sense that you have a global market that comes to a halt in one way, one way or the other. And that means that this time there has been an international dimension to this, which is something that we haven't had had before of this of this uh, mag, 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 magnitude, and 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 that also means that when you look at the rules of the game, the the regulatory frameworks that we have, and how you actually go about dealing with these issues, you very quickly come to the conclusion that most of the rules are national, while banks are international, cross border in one form, one form, one form or the other. And that really, really added some extra, extra difficulties this time when it comes to dealing, dealing, with, de dealing with it. One, one issue uh, that, that, arose, that, that showed up very, very early in this, in, in this, uh, this episode was, was the lack of liquidity in the global market, or the other way around. For many years, uh, also nationally active banks uh, got used to the idea that you could go and fund yourself wherever in the world where money was cheap. So you did not really have to reflect all that much about where money was coming from locally or from the other side of the, the, side of the world. Then all of a sudden, what you got from elsewhere stopped. And then that brought the global financial system uh, almost, to, almost to a... a, a so thank you so much for... for now then you have new types of financial systems and, and, and then in this about world. You have the those banks, crisis, the way out and the way, the way, the the way, the way forward is really, really a Swedish case where for basically to banks to are okay government. domestically. Yeah. But that doesn't really and help you, you if you have uh, done, how I can, how, how I look at if you're not doing all right, 
in other parts of the world, I mean, and it's a very substantial part of your income from the global market. I can talk about this, various aspects of this for hours. Now, so if the banks are not okay domestically, then of course that has to be more. Because if the banks are in trouble and domestically, and if they finance themselves globally in one way or one way or the other, to figure out that where, to, where, where to start and, and where to, where, where to end. And, and, and this is more actually in the form of a conversation about what is, what, yeah, what is yeah, going on. And it gets even yeah. harder to deal with. Yeah. Deal yeah. with yeah. Or, or speech. And then, but how, get, how does uh, then go let's get going on the on the on the current financial crisis? What's the what is the way? What is the way oh, out? Thick books will um, be written by historians in the future about about, about well, this. But but there's there are many many other views on this. So in, in the end, kind of it's about confidence and, and trust. And, and, is and uh, why is that so? Well, that's because that banking have, is essentially storytelling. Banking is, is telling what stories what about the future. Think that the convincing kind of what, the creditors and the depositors that 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 they're going to get their money back. And if you can tell good and stories about the future, they'll stay. Understood. And but if they don't believe in your stories, they'll leave. Years, and it's happy. hard to look into the future, and so the story, the story is better be good. Maybe if it's not because if there aren't, you, uh, have, you uh, have, have a problem. Get out. And, 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 and this and is sort of the no essence of banking, and it's also the essence of what is called fractional reserve banking. You can't increase the size when you of have the fairly low equity capital out the compared door, to the rest of the sort of finance. Kind of and, and then you end up with all sorts of problems, problems with, with, with that. This time, this time uh, we had we have had a, a mismatch between the financial, financial activities when it became so the foggy out there, so that people could not judge it whether a bank was okay in general terms. But a few then that's when the things that are actually different. And then that forces, in one way or the other, somebody to step in and do something. Looking more back on the most of the financial crisis have been like sort of national or not having to, or having to do these, few uh, do these but not transnational. Because when it's foggy out there, you, you cannot, you don't trust the quality of the assets, nor do you fully understand that means that this the location of the assets. And when that happens, and when that happens that people stay at home and, and they sit and scratch their heads and they wonder what's going on. And when that happens, the whole and, and that also means that when you look at and this happened more or less more of the game, the also the regulatory frameworks like with our banks and how you that weren't really affected by the dealing with these issues. You very quickly come to the conclusion because that most of that the Swedish system wasn't really the well, banks are international. But then Cross almost the overnight, this affected everybody. And, and that it really, really added some extra you extra that you will notice this time when you it comes to the bank. Really 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 one one, one, one issue uh, <coughs> that, at the road, not there. that showed up then very, very early in this, in in this, this um, way. This episode was so uh, confidence was is always quite essential to, to operate the other way around. For many and years, in order to uh, solve the crisis, more nationally active banks, and that's uh, basically used to the idea that you could go and fund you found yourself say, wherever well, you in know, the world. Where money it's was. too bad that we had this accident. So you did not really have we to will behave better all that future. much about where money was And this is how we go about actually doing the other ABCD and so on. In such a way that, that you can trust that all of a sudden, this is the last time that this is going to happen. And if you have a credible story, then, then, then usually you can get the thing going. And part of, the, part of a credible story under these circumstances will always be somebody's got to come up with more capital. Because without enough capital in the system, then, then it's very, very hard to, to rebuild uh, confidence. Once that has happened, uh, you need to preserve confidence in order to avoid the next crisis. And that's when you get into the rulemaking. That's when you get into arguing about what sort of rules do we need in the future? How do we go about doing this in such a way that it doesn't, that it doesn't happen again, uh, either nationally or nowadays actually uh, uh, globally? And in addition to that, uh, what is needed in my view uh, on top of sort of what, what we deal with nationally is also to create trust and confidence among authorities dealing with these issues within Europe, let's say, but also actually, actually globally. Uh, because given that we have so much cross-border banking in one form or the other today, it becomes increasingly hard 
to manage a banking sector just simply on your own. And that holds particularly in small open economies uh, where, where the banks are active outside your own country and where a good part of the funding comes from, a uh, good, good part of the funding comes from, from elsewhere. So we just cannot, in my view, manage these situations anymore without dealing with the cross-border aspect of it in, in, one, in one form or, uh, or, or, or the other. And, but if that is done, then that will actually also, over time, restore confidence and trust in such a way that, that, that this thing gets going again. And then how does one then go about doing that? Well, recognize the losses. People hate it, but that's the way things are. A loss is a loss is a loss, and normally it doesn't go away. That means that usually you are better off actually dealing with the losses comparing to just sitting on it, hoping that this issue will disappear. And that means, that, of course, that you have to recognize the losses, you have to take the consequences coming from that, and, 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 and also deal with the, the, bad, the, the bad assets. Now, why is it so hard to deal with bad assets? I've asked myself that many times, and I've had to deal with this during my years at the IMF in a huge number of countries, of course, starting out in the early 90s in my, in my own countries. And the issue is always the same, being it Sweden in the early 90s, being it Indonesia in the late 90s, or being it Iceland uh, today, and a huge number of countries in between. That is because when you, when you make losses, that creates a substantial redistribution of ownership titles. And when that happens in the banking sector, that becomes, in most economies, very, very sensitive. Because what that actually means, as in my case, when you are a civil servant, you're going to have to take some of your, some of, some of your friends to court and you're going to have to bankrupt some people you know, and they always claim that they're not bankrupt, that things will be fine tomorrow, but that doesn't matter if you can't pay today. And, and, and that's why it, it is so sensitive, because in the end, there are so many, I don't know what to call it, economic phenomena that are sort of filtered through the banking sector in one way or the other. And all this stuff ends up in the banking sector in one form or the other when you get into this business about recognizing, <laughs> recognizing the losses. And when you start dealing with that, it also forces you to try to understand what you actually end up holding, what, you, what people actually had or have in those, in those loan, loan portfolios. And in many cases, you'll find and this you don't find in the textbook, because in the textbook they always sort of talk about moral hazard, uh, taking risks uh, when somebody else is in eventually going to pay. But in a good number of cases, when you actually get into the business of loss recognition, you also realize that people were pretty clueless. Because you find all sorts of stuff in those loan portfolios that, that they didn't really fully understand what it what it, what it was. And I think in most cases when you look at these episodes and, and, and look at it sort of exposed, most of it was bad decisions, not, not, not illegal in, in, in the sense that there was something sort of criminal about it, because it's not a crime to make bad decisions. Uh, but, but it's still pretty bad for the shareholders and the depositors. But, but there, is this, there is a difference. There is a difference there that one needs to be, be aware of. So, you deal with the bad. You deal with the bad assets, uh, and uh, without dealing with the bad assets, basically you, normality won't return. Because as long as there are bad assets out there in one form or the other, and it's not fully understand understood how you're going to create this uh, redistribution of ownership titles, people basically sit at home and scratch their heads, wondering <coughs> what's next. And then that means that economic activity goes, uh, goes down. There's a good chapter in the, in, the, in the World Economic Outlook and in the Global Financial Stability Report from the IMF recently where they show that if you have a financial crisis of a, of, which is substantial in, 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 in a country, it takes about three to five years before you reach the GDP level 
that you had before, before sort of disaster struck. And the sooner you start dealing with the problems, the more likely it is that growth will come back compared to if you just kind of not really do, do, much, uh, do, do, do much about it. And in order, in order to basically to regain confidence, one needs to find methods of restarting the markets. And restarting the markets, of course, normally means that prices will have to fall because the good old world is not going to come back and nothing really much happens in the system until you have find methods of reshuffling these assets in such a way that you can establish a new, a new price level. And you know, in order to do that, to establish this new price level, normally what you need to do is to, 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 to use a realistic and, realistic and transparent valuation process such that people can fully under understand how you actually go about evaluating these, these loan, loan portfolios and how that, how that happens. And this is, of course, always a, quite a debate because those who are sitting on the bad assets normally say that I have this wonderful portfolio of, of, of assets. It's, it's worth 100. And those who buy the bad assets tend to say, yeah, but since I'm the only buyer, I only want to pay 25. <laughs> And there you need to find a way of sort of bridging that gap in, in, in one way or the other. And until that is sorted out, nothing, nothing, much, nothing much happens. And this is how we did it in the early 90s, and this is how it has happened in many, in, in, in many, in many other, other, other countries. I'm not, going to go into, I'm not going to go into these particular aspects in, in, in great detail. Uh, the short version of all of this is that once you do all these things, Basically, it's all about corporate finance. It's about corporate finance where in many, many cases, the government ends up being via the, or the, the central bank usually ends up being the lender of last resort. But also, whether you like it or not, normally governments end up being the owner of last resort. And, and a simple short story is to say that in bad times, the public sector goes long in banks while the private sector goes short in banks. And when the, when the good times come back, then the private sector goes long in banks again and the public sector goes short in banks. So that's how you sort of go through, go through this, this type of a uh, cycle. Now then, going, going, uh, go, going forward, what, what is it that we have to... to uh, to, to deal with. Well, first of all, financial stability ultimately depends on the taxpayers in the sense that the government sets the rules of the game and eventually, if you have a very large problem in the financial sector, it's a sort of like an not uninsurable event. It's, some, it's an event of such a magnitude that you cannot insure this in the private sector because no, no one is willing to take that kind of a risk. It's very, very similar to sort of like a, a hurricane or, or an earthquake or something like that. Uh, a major financial disaster is sort of like an earthquake in the financial sector. Uh, and that cannot usually be insured in the, in the private sector. So somehow, whether you like it or not, the government gets, uh, get, gets in, 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 uh, involved. And when the government gets involved, then usually there, there, is, a, there is a price tag that goes with it. Uh, and that... Uh, uh, Honohan and Klingebil uh, came to the conclusion that, that on average we are talking about 13% of GDP uh, as the cost of cleaning up, cleaning up the system. There are a few cases where the net cost was basically zero, and then there are other costs in Indonesia, uh, which, is what, which, which was about 50% of GDP, and I don't know what the final number in Iceland is going to be, but I think it's uh, probably 100% or maybe, maybe even more before everything is... Is settled, settled, settled there. So these these events are, are 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 sort of costly to the taxpayers. They're hard to deal with. But when I'm talking about cost here in GDP terms, that's only talking about it in terms of redistribution between uh, between uh, the public sector and the private sector. The real cost to society is uh, usually negative growth, a shrinking economy for several years. And that's, one, that's why one needs to think about sort of the rules of the game in order to uh, avoid these episodes in the, in the future. Because it's not only loss of growth. If you look at the numbers, you also find that you will, it, it's very hard to get back to the old growth path 
and in order to end up with a net cost of zero in a growth uh, sense, then you need to, for a number of years, be above your average growth path in order to, to sort of make it, make it a wash. And that's highly likely not going to happen. So in that sense, when, when you go through, through these episodes, it, it ends up being a deadweight loss to society as a whole. And that's why we need to think about what the rules are and how one goes forward in such a way that, that these are uh, truly, truly low frequency, low frequency uh, events. One of the issues with low frequency, though, is that one, very late one night in the finance ministry in the early 90s, when we were about to take over a bank, uh, I, I asked my, my legal counsel, could you give me some advice on how to actually do this? Uh, how you, when, could you, can you tell us what happens when a bank goes bankrupt? And then he was, you know, flipping the pages, and, and after a while he came back and said, no, I can't, because the last time a bank went bankrupt in this country was 1905. <laughs> And there's no one around who can give us guidance. <laughs> so we actually have to start from scratch when it comes to dealing with, dealing with that, the, uh, that one. So low frequency events, fine, but still with a frequency. So that's why one needs to be prepared to, to how, how to deal with these issues. And that's why one needs to have a set of, set of, set of rules for, for dealing, dealing with these issues. Now here we are uh, at a crossroad when it comes to dealing, dealing with this. And I'm talking about this from a sort of a European perspective, but it's, you can just as well talk about it from a, from a sort of a, a global, global perspective. But in the rest of my, in the rest of my, my, my conversation here, I'm gonna to refer to what's going on in, in, in Europe because it, it comes most, 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 most naturally to, 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 to us, given that, that, all of, that we are both, both countries are members of the uh, uh, EU. Now, then, what has happened within the EU? Well, again, exaggerating a bit, you can say that given the rules that we have uh, trying to create an internal market, European-wide market within the EU, we have created a set of rules such that we can grow a banking sector in, into any size, shape, and form, including uh, the cross-border aspect of it, which is fine because that's what, what we wanted. The problem with, with, with that concept today, though, is that once that has happened, we do not presently have a proper set of rules dealing with the banking sector at the national level once it has outgrown you. And that's really what the future rulemaking in, in an EU context is, is, is all, all about. How do we maintain a single market while at the same time we get a better handle on these issues uh, than, than we have had in the, uh, in, in, in the past? And basically, uh, we have three options when it comes to, to, to doing this. The first way is what I have called the protectionist approach. We just say, this was no good. We ended up with a problem. Let's start shrinking the banking sectors again so that they become national. And then deal with all of this at the national level because that's where the, most of the rulemaking still takes place. And then, uh, then, then let's see what, uh, what happens because then for sure we get a, a good handle on what is, what is going on. Now though, that implies, doing it in this, this way implies that we would need to roll back decades of globalization and, and, and financial integration. And I think for sure that that would not be a good thing. So this is not, uh, this is not a, a realistic way of go going about because the way I look at it, there is a, a consensus actually, I think pretty much that we want an open, uh, uh, competitive and uh, efficient financial sector uh, within, within Europe. So we will uh, continue to have banks that are very, very active in a cross-border fashion in, one, in, in one, one way or the other. So sort of backtracking, uh, backpedaling completely, uh, I don't think that that will happen. The other extreme is to do it, uh, do it the other way around and say, well, since uh, we do need to have some sort of a safety net here, 
and these things are very, seem to go wrong once in a while, then we need to have some, for, some form of European uh, tax system to, to tax the banks in order to, to have enough money to pay for this if things go wrong. Or at least we need to have some type of uh, ex-ante burden sharing uh, mechanism in place when it comes to dealing with, dealing with these issues. But in the short run, this is, not, this is not realistic because taxation continues to be a sovereign national, national issue. And this involves uh, public spending, using public funds in one way or the other. Uh, maybe part of it comes via deposit, deposit insurance systems. But presently, there is no appetite for setting up a sort of a pan-European system dealing with, dealing with these issues. So this is, this is sort of hypothetical. We're, we're far from, from having a sort of a completely European, European system presently. And that means that we have a third, a third way of, uh, of doing this. And that's, that's basically to enhance cross-border cooperation. And, and that way try to improve the resilience of the, of the, of the financial uh, uh, systems. And, and this, is, this is basically where we are. This is what we have to work with presently. Because to, to, to just sort of shrink the financial sectors back to national levels, that's not going to happen. And to have something truly, truly sort of pan-European, uh, politically there is no appetite for that presently. So that's not going to happen either. And that, that means that we need to find other ways of dealing with what one could call this uh, geographical mismatch between banking activities and the rulemaking uh, surrounding banking activities. Uh, because uh, financial supervision and regulation still can, continues to be basically done at the, at the national, uh, national level. And that means that we just have to get used to the idea and continue to cooperate and cooperate much, much more than what we have done, uh, th than what we have done in, this, in, in, in the past. So cooperation is essentially presently the only feasible, feasible option. And in doing so, we need to learn and get better at doing that in good times. Because if you don't cooperate in good times, it's almost impossible to cooperate in bad times. It's easier if you know who you are, supposed to, who you are talking to, and it's easier if you set up systems for providing you with relevant information in good times than picking up the phone in bad times and then asking others to provide you with the... Uh, with the uh, with the numbers, so access to information is is crucial when it comes to it comes to dealing with dealing with this, and this is also by by cooperating over the years you actually build trust and you build trust among uh, among regulators, governments, and supervisors, so that one, once you have to deal with these issues, it's more likely that you can deal with them in a cooperative fashion compared to to not, because if we don't deal with these issues in a cooperative way, it's more likely that the word uh, ring fencing shows up and that the whole thing sort of in bad times reverts to, to again, various types of national solutions <laughs> where you break up banks along, let's say, national, national lines, and, and that's very, very hard to do, and you probably destroy a lot of, uh, uh, there's probably a lot of value destruction uh, when those things happen because usually you are short of time, you have imperfect information, and these things are just, sort of, just sort of happens. Now, one, one, one example when, when cooperation has been going on for a long time is that uh, among the Nordic central banks, the governors of the Nordic central banks have met regularly, regularly I think, for almost 100 years. So, so compared to in, in, in some other cases, we have a reasonably good starting point. That doesn't mean that it's always it's easy in my part of, the, part of Europe either, uh, but at least we have talked on the phone in the past and, 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 and many times, and that, that for sure makes it easier compared to if you sort of start from, from scratch uh, when, when, when things, uh, things uh, fall, 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 fall apart. Now, uh, what is it that we then the need to do. One key element is to uh, improve cross-border crisis management. And, and here we have actually 
uh, here actually a few things have happened. If you take a longer time perspective, I was one of the few persons in the 90s involved in, in these conversations in Europe, always arguing that this had to happen. Because all the Nordic countries then, in various shapes and form, Denmark the least, but Sweden, Norway, and Finland had had pretty serious banking crisis, and all of us had come to the conclusion that this actually needed to be dealt with uh, in, in, in a cooperative uh, way. But 15 years ago, when I raised those issues in various uh, EU meetings, it was just dead silence in the room. Now, 15 years later, we have made it to the point that it's OK to talk about it. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that, given, that we, given now that it's OK to talk about it, it doesn't mean that we know fully how to solve the problem. But it still is a major step forward compared to go, going back in back in time, because now many, many more have come to the conclusion that this is pretty tricky to deal with, so we actually need to accept that this is the way the world looks, and we, we need to find mechanisms of talking, talking about it. The other part is that, that we need to strengthen the regulatory and the supervisory framework, and we can't do that uh, anymore uh, at the, at the strictly, strictly national, la national level. First issue, then, if you look at uh, cross-border crisis management, what we, what we need to do is to figure out how to, how to harmonize bank resolution regimes so that we don't have large asymmetries when banks run into trouble and you end up doing it one way on one side of the border and complete, in a completely different way on, on, on the other side of the border. And so far here, the, the rules, the regulatory frameworks within Europe are sort of spotty in the sense that... that uh, uh, the deposit guarantee directive gives some, some kind of uniformity to this, but I also think that, that we need to, need to take a second look at that, that directive because we have a few unfortunate cases where there hasn't been enough money in these systems, and, and, and then that, that, that creates, a, that, that creates a, a problem. But on, beyond that, presently actually the EU lacks common... Uh, common regulations on crisis management, and also countries have different uh, bank insolvency regimes. And that means that if you have a large uh, cross-border bank, then it gets very, very complicated, complicated to, to sort of dis disentangle that. And this is, of course, exactly why, why, why in, in, in the London market they came up with this concept of a living will, that you sort of should write down ex ante uh, how you... How, how you how you, how you um, pick, by, pick a bank apart, so to speak, if, if, you, have to, if you have to do, uh, do, do that. So, so far, uh, handling, falling, uh, ha handling this can only be at, uh, along national, national lines. And if that happens, then that runs the risk of actually undoing the integration that, that we have tried to achieve in the past. And it would be quite helpful if we could eventually, but that probably takes many, many years, if we could come up with sort of generally accepted EU-wide EU rules uh, telling us uh, how to intervene early, uh, how to reconstruct banks, or how to wind up banks in such a way that it is commonly accepted and understood uh, throughout Europe how this how this actually actually is supposed to be so supposed to be done. Now the other part of it, reg when it comes to regulatory reform, and it, this is not only a European issue; this is very very much a, a, a global issue. Uh, one is liquidity regulation. And, and if you look at the Basel I, the Basel I rules and Basel II rules, liquidity regulation was, was, was kind of lacking. And, and not very much time was spent on, on, on dealing, with, uh, uh, dealing with this. And part of fractional reserve banking is, is still that you need liquidity. And you need to think hard about uh, how, to, how to make sure that that you do not have too much of a maturity mismatch. Because if people want their money, you need to find mechanisms for actually giving people their money. Uh, because if that doesn't happen, then, then you have a, you have a, a, a problem. And, and, and most unfortunately, when, when things go wrong, uh, my experience is that uh, 
Markets tend to function the worst when you need them the most. <laughs> and, and that's why you need to think hard about liquidity, liquidity rules so that you have enough cash on hand, let's say within 30 days, another type of liquidity, let's say within one year, uh, so that you actually can, can manage uh, for a while so that you don't run into enormous difficulties almost, uh, almost uh, immediately. And the other part is capital regulation. How much capital do you need? And, and, and there, uh, time will tell what will happen. It's too early to tell what the Basel Committee will come up with. But for sure, capital requirements will go up. And one important part of that conversation is, is, is also to look into uh, really pure tier one high quality capital not to have too much hybrid capital of various uh, sorts. Uh, because when you are making losses, uh, those losses are written off against a tier one capital. And, 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 and that, that's when people very, very quickly realize that that sort of uh, tier two capital is more for show. <laughs> and and, and when, when things, go, things go wrong. And, and that's why we need to have a serious conversation globally on, on what the level of tier one capital is supposed to be and, uh, and what the uh, quality of the tier, tier one capital is going to be in the, in the, in, in the future. Uh, this, this, of course, will in due course create a huge debate because at the same time I think it's important to stress, particularly when it comes to capital regulation, that, that this is not something that, that is supposed to happen tomorrow. Because given, given where we are sort of uh, when it comes to uh, growth and growth in the glo global economy, it wouldn't be proper to jack up capital charges right now uh, because uh, that would hamper, uh, hamper growth and, 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 and would also hold back the supply and credit. And presently, given where we are, uh, we, are we, we actually need to make sure that there is a supply of credit in the, in the, system, in the system as a whole. So once, uh, once, the, once uh, things uh, look brighter, uh, that's when, 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 uh, when capital charges will increase. And I also think that uh, when that happens, we're going to have a, uh, a phasing in period such that, 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 that this uh, isn't too much of an abrupt uh, effect from one, one day to the, to, to, the, to, to the next. The other part of it is supervisory reform. And, and now, again, in a, in a European context, a whole bunch of new acronyms. I have a hard time myself uh, because this is so fresh, fully understanding uh, what, 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 they, what they really mean, but I have good people working for me translating so that I know what it is. <laughs> and, and most likely ESRB, uh, the European Systemic Risk Board, is sort of in the cards. The final negotiations are going on within the next uh, few months. And that means that this new body is likely to come into existence in the course of, in the course of next year. And, and, and that means that, uh, that uh, in a sort of an ECB context, you know, within, an, within the, uh, th this new uh, supervisory body will spend its time dealing with what is called macroprudential supervision. Macroprudential here is sort of uh, meaning that reflecting on issues going on in the economy such that you worry about what is going on uh, even if each individual transaction at the micro level and at, at the bank's level seem to be sort of reasonably, reasonably okay, uh, but you worry about them because you, 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 you worry about them because you still have to reflect on whether the sum of all the things going on is going to be sort of proper or, 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 or something dangerous is, is going on. How the ESRB will evolve over time, we don't know as of yet. What will come out of this is just, just too early to tell. It's a new function we haven't had before. And whether this is going to become a body with clout or not so much clout, we just don't, we just don't, we just don't know. But this is going to be a very, very, uh, very, very uh, fascinating and challenging exercise to, to, to at the pan-European level, carry out these conversations, and actually then at the end of the day also opine 
on this, that, and the other, and opine on things going on in such a way that, that you really expect something to happen. Because what this is all about, when, when we're talking about monetary policy, sometimes we explain monetary policy in terms of the punch bowl, and somebody taking away the punch bowl when the party gets going, that's when interest rates go up. Now, what actually is going to evolve here over time is a similar type of activity, but dealing with prudential issues. Because if we truly worry about what here is called macro prudential, that essentially means that on the supervisory side, somebody's got to be willing to take away that punch bowl too. Because if that doesn't happen, then, then this is just sort of a conversation piece. And, and whether that will actually happen or not, it's too, too, early, too early to tell. But that's really the essence of what now is being, being created. Because there are many, there exist many, many bodies already where people talk. Uh, but, but, but the whole idea is to take it beyond that, so that if you really worry about something, it should be clearly stated. And then somebody out there should be expected to actually change the rules. And then to change the rules in this new world actually means changing the rules in such a way that those changes become binding. Because they aren't binding, then then nothing much, nothing much happens. But if you, how it's going to happen, too early to tell. Uh, but many, 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 all, the Europe, all, all central banks in Europe are involved in this, in this exercise in one form or the other. And in those countries where supervision is outside the central bank, the national supervisors uh, are also involved, in, involved in, 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 in this, and particularly involved, of course, in the course of next, uh, next year. Then we have the other part, the microprudential supervision, which is also going to show up on a Europe, at the European level in the form of, of the European, uh, European uh, Banking Authority, which is going to give sort of guidance of sorts to national uh, uh, banking supervisory authorities. And then we have the European Insurance and Occupational Pension Authority, which is basically dealing with with, 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 with insurance and then uh, securities, uh, securities uh, markets. Now, to set up this arrangement has been sort of in the cards for I don't know how long, and many have written learned articles about the need for having these changes take place. Uh, so it's going to, to, going to be quite interesting to see how this, how this, uh, how this com comes about and what it, what, it actually, what it actually means. Because the really hard part here, when you do this, when all the regulatory frameworks uh, from the beginning start at the national level, is that moving from something national to something European actually means that you have to give up a bit of sovereignty. And you have to give up a bit of sovereignty for the common European good. Because by now we know that if we, we have come to the conclusion that if we don't do that, given the cross-border, uh, given the common market and the cross-border aspects of banking, uh, the regulatory framework shouldn't sort of lag behind uh, what is going on in the, in, in, in the private sector. But it has been very, very hard to to, to engineer this, and it have, has, has, of course, been discussed for years and years when it comes to uh, doing, doing this. Finally, uh, let me try, and this is, this is, not, this is not so easy, because they're, they're summarize the, the regulatory ag agenda and what is, what is going, going on. And this can, of course, be, be done in many, many different ways, and this is not, not sort of, this is not for Europe only, this is what is going on in, in, in glo uh, globally. First, people have come to the conclusion that we need to strengthen the buffers in the financial sector. Now then, uh, how, how does one go about doing that? First is uh, to start with the capital of the banks. Conclusion being that banks need more capital. And then how do you go about that? You look at the quality of the capital, and you look at the level of the capital. And then you get into risk weights and how to do the, the risk weighting. 
And then you have the micro regulatory framework, which is basically what supervisors do. And then you have the macro part of it, uh, which is what the European uh, Systemic Risk Council is expected to be doing. And the macro part is really what has been added. Those other parts have been around for, for many, 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 many years. And then you have the non-risk weighted aspects of it, which is basically a leverage ratio. Uh, saying that regardless of all this other stuff, let's make sure that it, you cannot expand your balance sheet beyond a certain level, whatever that level is. So one can argue that, one could argue that you don't really need a leverage ratio given the rest of it. Uh, but the leverage ratio is kind of an extra safety belt in this, basically saying that if, we don't, if it's hard to understand all the rest of the technical stuff on the left-hand side, then a leverage ratio is sort of ensures that it doesn't sort of get totally out of hand because the balance sheets uh, grow too, too fast. And then on the other hand, we have this issue about liquidity, as I, as I mentioned, where people for many, many years took for granted that markets always work so that you can always get the liquidity from wherever you want it in the, in, in the world, but we need to do more on, on, on that, that side. And then this, uh, uh, this brings me to, to, the, to the conclusion. And, and let me just say that uh, the present crisis, in that sense, a window of, uh, window of opportunity. Uh, it's hard to tell though how, how long that window is going to stay open. Uh, because in my country, we put all sorts of uh, rules and regulations in place when we set up the bank support authority and the bad banks and all the rest of it. All of this had sunset clauses. So the whole machinery disappeared, and then the good times came, and there was no appetite to, to change the rules. So now when things turned bad again last year, all of this had to be brought back, writing new draft bills in, in a couple of weeks. And of course we would have been better off if, if this actually had been done 15 years ago. Uh, but, but that's the way these things go. Uh, when, when, when times are good, memory fades fast, and then you say, why bother with all this uh, complicated technical stuff? Uh, because it's not gonna happen again. But, but it does happen again, so that's why we really need to remind ourselves that this is a, a, window, of, uh, a window of opportunity and, 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 and we need to, uh, to really get the, get the, work, the work, work done. And maybe it's not for us, maybe it's for others, once I and others have retired to, to deal with it, but believe me, it's an enormous help when you run into difficulties if you have some guidance on the books compared to just starting from a blank sheet of paper having to make up all this stuff when you uh, when, when you go. So it's quite important actually to, to do, this, do, do this work. We need to uh, build confidence and, and uh, make sure that it stays and we need to create trust and not the least create trust among authorities uh, within Europe. The ESRB process is part of that. Part of that. Keep churning, keep talking and eventually uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to do it at the European level. We need to cooperate. Uh, because we are beyond the point of no return, I have argued, when it comes to cross-border cross -border banking. And we need to strengthen uh, the, rules, uh, the rules of the game the way, I, the way I have indicated. And that also needs to, do, needs to be done in a cooperative, <laughs> cooperative fashion. Uh, since since um, uh, being members of, your, uh, of the EU, uh, basically it's a, good, it, it's a good thing if we, as much as possible, can, can play by the same. Uh, rules. Thank you. Thank you for listening.